Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of your son in your hearts, crying out on the Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, but a son and an heir of God through Christ. It was just the cause of the progress of our Sunday school class. We ended up at the same place this morning. And, and we discussed some parts of this that we're not going to discuss in the service this morning. Things about Abba Father and, and some of the things like that, adoption of sons, and etc. But I want to major on that phrase, but when the fullness of time had come. Time is an amazing thing. Amazing. Time was created by God. Time is controlled by God. On the day that the time changed, I asked you the question, what time is it? And we discussed what time it was in our lives. But I want to look at time this morning in the light of the Christmas story. Now, Larry Farthing shares what Christmas means. Christmas means that he descended that we may ascend. It means that he became poor, that we could become rich. Christmas means he was born that we might be born again. He became a servant, that we could become sons. He had no home, that we might have a home in heaven. He was hungry, that we may be fed. He was thirsty, that we may be satisfied. He was stripped, that we may be clothed in righteousness. He was forsaken, that we might not be forsaken. He was sad so that we could be glad. He was bound, so that we could be free. He was made sin, that we may, might be made righteous. He died, that we could live. And he came down, so we could be caught up. Christmas means that God is never late. He's always on time. He never misses a deadline. He sent his son into the world right on time, in the fullness of time. God's timetable is always correct. Our timetable and God's time timetable are not always the same. There are times we want God to act right now. We pray, God, give me a promotion right now. God, get me out of debt right now. God, give me patience, and I want it. We understand that in his great wisdom, God chooses not to answer those prayers always. The one who created everything from nothing, who sees the end from the beginning, who embodies all wisdom and knowledge, is never late. He's always on time. Of course, it may not be our time, but it is his time. In the Christmas season, we see the great reminder of the fact that God sent his son in the right time. It's an amazing statement. Have you ever considered that there was a right time for Jesus to be born? I mean, why not a hundred years before? Why not a hundred years? What was the significance of that time? There was one time in all of history when things were perfectly right for Jesus to be born. Jesus came at the precise right time. Just as in God's timing was perfect in the coming of Jesus, his timing is perfect in our lives. That's tough sometimes to understand. Just as the people of Jesus' day didn't understand God's timing then, you may not understand it now. Nonetheless, it's perfect. Maybe today is the right time in your life for God to move in a special way. Today may be the time God speaks to your heart and comforts you and strengthens you and guides you and encourages you in something brand new. Today would be a perfect day for you to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. In our scripture passage, we see how God works in his plan, how his plan in history. We will learn how he works in our lives as we see his word. There was preparation for his coming. All through the Old Testament, we find hundreds of prophecies telling of the coming of the Messiah. There were prophecies concerning even the manner of his birth. There was prophecy concerning the fact that he would be born of a virgin. There was also prophecy concerning the place that he was to be born in Bethlehem. I've made the statement that prophecy in Scripture 
is the moment that God opens the window to his foreknowledge. And for just a moment, we get to see into the foreknowledge of God as prophecy comes and speaks to us the truth. All through the Old Testament, we see that there was religious or church preparation going on. All through the Old Testament, God had been dealing with Israel, his chosen people. It would be through them that the Messiah would come. But Israel was always going away from God. They were always following after other gods and other nations. God judged Israel for, his idol for their idolatry many times. This culminated in, the, in their judgment in the cap Babylonian captivity. God allowed the entire nation to be conquered by Babylon and taken away from their homeland into that country. So the Jews were prevented from following after idols of the pagan nations around them. Another thing that happened during the Babylonian captivity was that the canon of the Old Testament scripture was completed under Ezra. For the first time, the body of Old Testament literature, which is the Jewish Bible and our Christian Old Testament, was brought together. And this opened the way for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another thing that occurred during that captivity was that the synagogue came, came into being. Up until that time, the Jews had worshipped at the temple. Now there was no longer a temple, so the Jews assembled to worship in the synagogue. The synagogue is the worship pattern for the church, the church of Jesus Christ. All of these events had a role in preparing for the coming of Christ in the fullness of time. There was also cultural preparation. In 350 B.C., Alexander came on the scene. He was the son of the Macedonian king Philip. He was known as Alexander the Great. He conquered all the known world in 12 years. Under his influence, the world became Greek in culture, philosophy, institutions, art, drama, literature, architecture, thought, and language. Greek influence was so widespread that Greek became the international language. This was important because in 280 B.C., the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. This is called the Septuagint. Everything was ready for the preaching of the gospel. Religiously, the Old Testament scriptures were gathered. Linguistically and culturally, the lines of communication were open. The time was right. There was also political preparation. By the time Jesus was born, Rome ruled the world. The Romans had conquered all the nations around them. They built roads that would link the entire Roman Empire. They suppressed criminal acts and created a postal system. Did you know that? God determined those who would ascend to power in the Roman Empire. At the coming of Christ, Caesar Augustus was the emperor. Little did he know that when he called for a census, he would be doing God's will. Because of his edict, requiring all the people to return to their place of origin and be taxed and counted. A pregnant woman and her husband made a historic journey to the place where prophecy had said that the Messiah would be born. Mother, the Virgin Mary of Christ, was guided by the hand of God to the place prophesied. Then there was spiritual preparation. Verses 3 of that same uh, Galatians talks about how the, God prepared the people's hearts to receive the Messiah. It is by reading the Bible we come to know that we are sinners. Before Jesus came, people tried to keep all God's Old Testament laws, but they couldn't. Now we know that keeping the law can't save us. We know that we need a Savior, Jesus Christ. The fullness of time means that we now live in the full inheritance of God's spiritual blessings. Jesus came in the fullness of time to fulfill the work of God. There was so much more to that night in Bethlehem almost 2,000 years ago than merely a baby being born in nature. God sent his son. Jesus left his place of prominence and privilege in heaven to dwell in the womb of a young woman from Nazareth. The creator of the universe was carried in a woman. He was born of a woman. This speaks of his humanity. He was the offspring of the Holy Spirit. He had no human father. He is the absolute divine. In his mother, he was absolutely human. He refers to himself as the son of man 
and the Son of God. This is vital. Jesus understood what it was like to be a man. He knows the hurt, the hardships, and the grief of mankind. He knows what it's like to be human. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Do you think that I came to destroy the law of prophets? I came to fulfill it. God had purpose in Christ's coming. God had planned this event before the world was created. The time was right, and Christ came. Time. Him and I were discussing on our trip, and thank you for those who have asked. We did have a great trip. It was a safe trip. We had good weather. We had easy traffic, except for detours. We, we thought we were going to have to move into Louisville. We couldn't get out of Louisville. When we finally got out of Louisville, we couldn't get out of Indianapolis. So we got a tour of both of those little towns. But we did have a great trip. But in our conversation, we were talking about time and how it relates to us. <coughs> Our view of time is different for different people. One, where they are in time. Time is a different challenge for those who have more behind them than in front of them. Do you understand that? That means those that are... Time is, is, is a different challenge for those who have more behind them than... And time is a different challenge for those who have so much to look forward to before them. They see time totally different. And then our very nature sometimes affects how we look at time. They say that opposites attract, and it's true in so many ways. And, and I married a girl who has some, some different characteristics. And one of our real main differences is our view of time. You see, some of us, by our nature, want to restrict time. We want to hold time back, and, and if possible, either keep it right where it is, or really we would rather push it back a little bit. Go back to them good old days. By our nature, we'd just like to be 14 again. And we really don't, but we, you know, Think we do. Now, then there are others of us, and, and I'm in that, this category. We really like to push time. Not push it back, push it forward. Let's get on with it. You know, let's, let's change something. Quick. Let's, let's, let's get to the next chapter. We've done this. I'm done today. Let's get to tomorrow. Push it. Push it. Push it. Now, the problem with that is, in both of those situations, we've got our hand on time. And God has not given us the control of time. We don't have a steering wheel with the label time on it. There's nothing you can do about time. Tomorrow will be tomorrow. It will not be yesterday. Until Tuesday. And then it'll be yesterday. No matter what you think about it or do about it. Now, even beyond when we that's about where we stop in our conversation. But about at that spot. Where I like to push, she likes to push back. Time. But I've come to a realization. Really all we can do with time. And just get on and ride. That's all we can do. Just get on and ride. But it's moving. Now, if that frightens you, I've got the solution for that. Because you see, the ride of time is not a Sunday afternoon ride in the country. 